All right, we're in week number five, final week, the difference a day makes. I love our anchor verses. This specific anchor verse I love. It's in Isaiah chapter 55, verses six and seven. It says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them. How many of y'all are grateful for the mercy of God, for every mistake, for all of our moments? He will have mercy on them, and to our God, he will freely pardon. If you're taking down notes for week number five of the difference a day makes, today's sermon is titled, All It Takes Is One. All It Takes Is One. Let's pray, we're gonna jump in. God, I thank you for ears to hear you. God, we don't wanna just go through the motions. We're not just playing church on this last weekend of April. I thank you, Lord God, for the 12 folks that gave their lives to you last night at our services, those today that will be impacted by your presence across all of our campuses, specifically this one right now. I pray that you would meet us where we're at. Give us ears to hear you, a mind to understand. Most importantly, we are postured in a position of expectation with a heart to receive. If you believe us, say amen. You never know the difference a day makes. There's 24 hours in a day, 1,440 minutes in a day, 86,400 seconds in each and every day. How are you spending it? Our lives are made up of a series of moments. Every day, a moment is a domino effect to the next one. And just one moment can change everything. I remember when Jackie and I, we finally were like, Okay, we're gonna do this. Like, we're gonna, are we dating? Are we official? <laughs> are we gonna get engaged? Like, she's like, put a ring on the finger, okay? Like, if you like it, then you should have put a ring on it. And so uh, I was feeling uh, a little awkward about the future because I was still living with mom and dad. And I said to my parents, like, I feel this nudge that I need to find a place of my own. But y'all, my money was super funny. Like things were not exactly working out like I had hoped. And I stopped at this new coffee shop. We were living in Tulsa, this is post-college, and I'm living in Tulsa trying to figure out uh, how to get to what's next. God had spoken to me, he gave me the direction without all the details. I stopped at this new coffee shop and they, hands down, had the wor worst coffee I'd ever had. I'm a coffee uh, connoisseur. Coffee's my favorite color. And so I stopped and I was like, mm -mm, this is not gonna work. I've been invited to Maxwell's house and I'm super disappointed. Like this is not, this is not great coffee. But on my way out, there's this uh, gentleman from England who's talking real loud. And, and I, I didn't mean to overhear. I wasn't trying to eavesdrop, but I heard him say, no, it's crazy, man. I've got to move back to England. Now, now, Forgive me, this is gonna be like a blend of Australian, <laughs> England, and Scottish. So if I offend any of our beautiful culture of folks that blend into all of that. But he's like, if somebody just give me a little bit of this down payment, they can assume the note and I can walk away. So I walked by and I heard him say it. And as I walked out, I heard the Lord say, I sent you here for that moment. So this is awkward. So I'm like, walk back in, I'm like, Hey, uh, hey guys, I said, I'm so sorry. I uh, uh, kind of was eavesdropping, I apologize. He said, then what were you doing it, man? I was like, oh, <laughs> I'm gonna end up fighting this guy instead. And I said, I, I, heard, I overheard you talk about how you're, you're moving back to England. He said, yeah, I'm moving in a week and I have to have somebody take over my house. And I said, well, what does that look like? And he told me how much the payment was down. And at that time I had like $86 in my account. So I'm like, <laughs> So I'm only like $19,914 short. Like I can, if I can figure out how to, I can sell these shoes. Like what am I gonna do? And so I, I'm real confident because I got a big God. I said, how long? And so, you, so tell me about the house. He says, right over here if you wanna see it. We drive over and I literally, it, that moment, I'm like, I can see a glimpse of what Jackie and I's future is gonna start out like. And I'm looking at this house and, and I'm picturing me mowing and I'm picturing all this stuff. And I never did. I never mowed. I, <laughs> no. We'll pause there. So I, I, I'm talking to him, and he's like, you think he can do it? And I was like, oh, yeah. Listen. Can I post it a check? Like, is it? And I said, so when do you need this money by? He said, three days. And I said, is three days in England the same as seven to ten days? And I'm, if you say three days, does that mean 12 days here? Like, it's like dog years, like you actually three days is like a month. 
And he's like, three days, mate, or you can't have the house. Which again, I just switched it up again. That's Irish. That was Irish. I apologize. This is, I'm going to get in the words. Some of you are like, this is, if you're new here, I'm going to get into the Bible. Just give me a second. And, and I made a few calls. I talked to some family members, and they were like, hey, we're going to hook our faith up. Y'all, on the third day, I get a phone call from a family friend who said, man, I've been praying for you, and the Lord asked me to call you. Is there anything I can do for you? I began to talk to him, and he said, hey, I'm not even gonna, I'm not only gonna hook my faith up with you, I'm gonna loan you the money. You can have the money. I'm gonna loan this to you so that you guys can buy this house. That moment of me overhearing Peppa Pig's father speaking, because that's what he sounded like. That's what he sounded like. At that moment, that was, it changed everything. We were able to buy the house. Then the gentleman called us after we closed and said, hey, uh, instead of it being a loan, I'm just gonna bless you guys. It's a wed wedding gift. You don't even have to, y'all, the difference a day makes. We were able to sell that house, buy the next house, and it became a domino effect at that point. The difference a day makes, moments, well, it takes a moment for me the day I asked Jesus in my heart, Romans 10, verse 9 and 10, I confessed with my mouth and believed in my heart that he was Lord. The moment that he transformed my life was the most significant moment ever. It changed everything. On July 10th, 2004, I married the woman of my dreams. I convinced her that I had money. <laughs> it wasn't my looks. I was like, what's up, girl? But I played an acoustic guitar and I sang like John B. So it worked out. Almost 19 years later and four kids, another significant moment. We have moments, moments that we live by. And then we have moments that you can't help but laugh at. Like we have heavy moments and life-giving, life-changing moments. I promise we're going to get in the Bible. I have another story real quick. Uh, we were in the Midwest. I was leading worship at this church. And uh, these moments are amazing. I need these moments. We need these moments, y'all. Nehemiah 8, 10 says, the joy of the Lord is your. Listen, if you haven't laughed in a while, I believe you're going to get your joy back today. Y'all, like Stella got her groove back. You're going to get your joy back. Amen. Some of y'all need to get your joy back. You need to laugh a little bit. All right, so uh, we went to the Midwest, and we're leading worship at this, this church. And uh, every person that was coming in, for every person that came in, I watched this guy walk in. He walked in with a golden retriever. I was like, oh, that's cool. And then I watched a lady walk in, and she had like a little, little carrier with a cat in it. I was like. Okay. And then a guy walked in with a bird cage and a bird. I'm like, this is, I don't know if it's like a flea market pet sale. I don't know what's happening. And then a lady walked in with a large rabbit. You know what I'm talking about? Like the big, like large, like it has a human-sized head rabbit. This is a true story. For every person that was in the room, there was also an animal. It's like 400 people and 400 animals. And afterwards, I asked the pastor, I was like, what's, this is a wild moment. I said, what's the deal with all the animals? He said, let everything that has breath Praise the Lord. I was like, but what about allergies? Like, what about the guy who's allergic to the, the guinea pigs? Like, but it was a funny moment. Look at the person next to you and say, we're talking about moments. We're talking about moments. Some of you are like, are we going to start doing that? Because I got a labradoodle I want to bring. <laughs> I believe that moments shape and change the trajectory. If you read throughout the Bible, even the day that we had our first son, I can't tell you what we had eaten the night before, I can't tell you what I had for breakfast. What I remember is the moment. The moment that I heard him cry. The moment that I looked at my wife and said, you did, you did great, babe. These are moments that shape and define you. Last week we talked about David. He was a man of wealth, status, and power. A man who was after God's heart, who led a nation into its best years of history. We read about how there was a great distance between the moment he was anointed and becoming the king, that the prophet Samuel stops at David's father Jesse's house, passes on all seven of his brothers, but takes a boy who is in the middle of the field, the obscurity of the field, shepherd boy, who was being prepared and ready by God to become king. We love the story, but it took 13 years from the moment he was anointed till he stepped into the office of king. We saw God's faithfulness. We saw his hand moving. And it's amazing what happens when we lean into his presence and we lean into the moments. So this week, I want to look at a story. If you're a student of the Bible, if you've been around church for any amount of time, you know this story. But I want to look at the story at, of the woman at the well. In John chapter 4, we're going to start in verse 1. Now, we're a Bible foundation church. So we're going to have it on the screens. You can take pictures if you want. 
I encourage you to go back and read the whole passage. But we're gonna read 25 verses here. And I believe the foundation of this is, is, is fascinating. Jesus, starting in verse one, knew the Pharisees had heard that he was baptizing and making more disciples than John. Verse two, although Jesus himself didn't baptize them, his disciples did. Now pause, that's amazing. Jesus knew that if I can raise up those to carry healing in their hands, and I can raise those up that will go and tell of my Father's work, this thing will become a domino effect of moments. Jackie and I showed up yesterday to the Serve Project. There were people that our team, that y'all, interacted with, talked with, hugged, loved on, gave things to, that we never even got a chance to meet. That's the beauty of the gospel. That's the beauty of the good news. It's contagious. So Jesus, verse three, leaves to go to Judea, return to Galilee. Verse four, he had to go through Samaria on the way. Eventually, he came to a Samaritan village called Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. Verse seven, a Samaritan woman came to draw water. And Jesus said to her, please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some water burger. Verse nine, <laughs> the woman was surprised for Jews refused to have anything to do with the Samaritans. Jesus, uh, she said to Jesus, you're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? She was a little punchy, okay? Verse 10, Jesus replied, if you only knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. I love this, verse 11. But sir, you don't have a rope. You don't have a bucket. She said, this well's very deep. Where would you get this living water? Like, I can just imagine this interaction. And besides, she says, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals have enjoyed? Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will soon be thirsty again. She's like, Don't, have you ever heard of water with electrolytes? <laughs> she didn't say that. But verse 14, but those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Jesus is articulating to this woman, hey, what you have been searching for. Now, yes, there's this physical water that quenches thirst, but what he's literally unpacking for her is the gift of salvation. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water that I'll never be thirsty again. And I won't have to come back here to get any water. Jesus, this is where he's just amazing. Verse 16, he says, well, go get your husband, Jesus told her. She said, I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Jesus said, you're right. You don't have a husband, for you have had five husbands. And you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth, sir, the woman said. You must be a prophet. Then Jesus unpacks a few more things and gets to verse 23 and says, the time is coming, and indeed it's here now, when the worshipers, true worshipers, will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. For God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Real quick, how many of y'all love to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth? Come on. I've unpacked this before, but to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth is a pure, innocent, authentic expression of your faith, your trust, and your heart in God. It has nothing to do with your ability to sing on key. That should free some of you up. We can hear you. We were singing, come again. Some of you are like, come again. And you were creating your own melodies. And God loves it. The person next to you is like, okay, make a joyful noise. Amen. Ooh, maybe inside voice, joyful noise. But no, listen, sing from the top of your lungs. I've said this before, don't judge somebody's passion until you know their past. When they're singing out loud and worshiping their expressive way, you don't know what they've been through. Jesus is expressing, hey, it's not about your gifting, your talents. You bring your authentic expression of your faith and trust. That's the way God receives worship. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. Can you imagine? She's literally sitting there talking to Jesus Christ. She said, I know he's gonna be coming, the one who is called Christ. When he comes, 
He will explain everything to us. Then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. Everything began to shift in her life. We're gonna unpack her journey a little bit more, but verse 39, many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said, watch this, he told me everything I ever did. When they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in their village. So Jesus stayed for two days, long enough for many more to hear his message and believe. Then they said to the woman, now we believe, not just because of what you've told us, but because we heard from him ourselves. Now we know he indeed is the savior of the world. I love the testimony. Revelation 12, 11 talks about how the blood of the lamb is the word of our testimony. That's why I say all the time, share your story. Whether it's squeaky clean and perfect and polished and you're like, I literally have never done anything wrong. I only watch Christian films, listen to Christian music. Amazing, tell your story. Or maybe you're the opposite. You're like, oh, you don't know my journey. I found a dead body in a Motel 6 pool. You're like, wow, that's very specific. <laughs> tell your story. She was going all over the Samaritan region and saying, he told me everything I ever did. So here's a question. What do you do in your humanity when someone calls you out? Your community, a family member, a friend, a loved one, a spouse, even a pastor, a spiritual leader. Do you get all puffed up like, Psh, you don't know me? She could have done that. When Jesus said, I, I get it, you're not married. You've actually been married five times and the man you're living with now is not your husband. Psh, you don't know me, who are you? When you're shepherd crocs, you don't know me. No, do you get puffed up when somebody says, hey, I see you. I, I see what you've done. I see where you've been. Do you get angry? Do you push them away? Do you get petty? How do you respond when someone in your life who loves you, who you have accountability with or trust equity with, checks you before you wreck yourself? I'm serious because this has become a massive issue. This whole story could have gone the opposite. She could have said, I bid you farewell and your weird living water analogy, I'm out. No, instead, she was intrigued because he was prophetically speaking to the core of her soul. He was speaking to the depths of her being. You've been broken. You've been running. You've been hiding. You've been compartmentalizing your pain. So how do you react? I wanna, I wanna talk real quick. I wasn't gonna do this, but I felt led as I was putting my notes together. Uh, if you identify as petty, if you frequently participate in petty behavior, unfortunately, you're not a safe place. People that struggle with this, you would say, well, I'm just petty, that's just the way it is. What you're saying is I'm actually wounded and I'm refusing to heal. Yeah, so the reality is, if, because when you're petty or you're struggling, what you end up doing is saying, the moment I decide that I have a reason to be offended by you, I'm also gonna do my best to make sure you're just as wounded as I am. So being petty isn't a badge of honor. It's actually a warning sign to heal. Look at the person next to you and say, don't be petty. Come on, don't be petty. That was free. Again, healthy people, healthy people help people heal. Healthy people help other people get healthy. And we're all a work in progress. That's why I talk about telling your story because you can say, listen, I'm not where I wanna be, but I'm a work in progress and I'm, in the process of preparation for more because he's qualified me for more. But let me tell you how far I've come and where I'm going. And if God brought me from there to here, he can help you get from here to there. Look at the person next to you and say, tell your story. Come on, tell your story. Healthy people help other people get healthy. So I wanna break this verse down, this passage of verses for another few moments. John chapter four, in the 16th verse, Jesus took the initiative in leading the woman to recognize who he, who he was by referring to her personal life. He spoke into the depth of her heart, but also showing her, hey, I see you. Verse 17, the woman responds with a little bit of a deceptive answer as a reaction against further questioning. People are really good about deviating. It's like, did you do this? Like, we'll ask one of our kids, like, hey, did you guys eat this snack? Define snack. Like, when you say a snack, do you mean a cheese stick? Wrapped in a piece of honey barbecue chicken? <laughs> Define that. 
No, are you, are you, do you have the ability to deviate? She was deviating because she didn't want further questioning. Verse 18, Jesus uses her answer to bring light to her struggles. Verses 19 to through 21, he begins to talk about the, the, the broken areas in her life that need to come to light. The woman is now presented with a choice. Will you come to the light or will you shrink back into the chaos, the darkness, the broken places that you've been self-medicating with other broken relationships and other toxicity? Will you shrink back? Verse 19, I love this. It says that the woman, in another translation, says that she comes to the light Jesus then explains in verse 24, 1 through 24 what true worship looks like and how she can come li literally duct tape, super glued and just piece back together into the presence of God and worship him in spirit and in truth. And in verse 25 and 26, the woman finally recognizes who Jesus is as he confirms and affirms, I am the Messiah. The story of the woman at the well is one of the most iconic encounters in the Bible because around noon, just to give you some context, we don't know a lot about this woman, but some of the key facts are her name was never revealed. She was a female of Samaritan race whom Jews do not associate with, has all these struggles in her personal relationships, and they used to gather as a social gathering around noon Sorry, in the mid-afternoon, she would gather because that's when they would all gather and have like a social interaction. But she deviated from that and went at noon, the hottest part of the day, because she wanted to avoid conflict. She wanted to avoid questioning. She, she wanted to avoid people that were gonna pass judgment and shame on her. Some of y'all are like, mm-hmm, I get it. Stay away from Nancy at work. She's always... <laughs> no, no, she wanted to stay away. So the hottest part of the day, she shows up because she knew she would be isolated. And here she meets Jesus, who also stopped at the hottest part of the day. Just picture, picture what's coming, y'all. We're about to enter back in to the heat of Houston. Somebody asked me this week, we were at this conference, and they said, why are you, why are you in Houston? It's so hot. I said, it reminds me to tell people about Jesus because <laughs> it's a glimpse of how hot hell Potentially, it's gonna be. Potentially. <laughs> Historically, though, and culturally, they would gather, but she, and her posture indicated that she was a social outcast. I love that Jesus would go out of his way. I love that the God, the creator of all things, who told the stars where to go, the moon, the sun, the galaxies, he created the ocean and told it where to start and where to stop. Y'all, he is a personal God. He's personal enough to go out of his way to stop in the heat of the day to call you by name. What a beautiful display of his love that he knows you by name. Elbow the person next to you and say, knows you by name. And we saw all throughout this series of verses that he goes out of his way. Why? Because he's a good, good father. The Bible says he's closer than a brother. He's a consistent friend who listens. and He's been chasing after you. Maybe you've been running. Maybe you were like those two dear brothers post Jesus' death on the road to Emmaus that were running and walking away from what they had been told because the truth seemed to have fallen apart. And then Jesus meets up with them. Maybe you've been running. I've got great news for you. He's been chasing after you. I've said it before. He's one mention of his name away. No matter how far away you've been, yeah, I get it. I get a preacher guy in your fancy pants. Like, are those Jackies? Like, those are, do they make those in men's? That's amazing. Stop it. It's not okay. Sure, it's really flowy. It's... He's just one mention of his name away from being right there. But you don't know what I've done. He does. And he still chooses you. The Bible says in Psalms 23, 6, surely his goodness and unfailing love will pursue you all the days of your life. The message translation says he chases after you. I can only imagine what that looks like, like a dad pursuing a daughter or a son who will live in the house of the Lord forever. So number one, if you're taking down notes, he is the God who pursues. Gosh, that's great news. 
He's the God who pursues. Some scholars believe that the woman, again, in this story, went there at noon to avoid all the others because it was easy for her to compartmentalize all her pain, to stay away from future interactions that would cause her to become more wounded. She was dipping in a well, getting away from the noise of everything that she had caused. So here's my question for you. What well are you dipping into when no one's around? What area of your life are maybe you self-medicating in? Maybe it's busyness. Maybe it's a late night habit, a pattern that you seem stuck in, a weekend pattern or a lifestyle that you're like, oh, I just keep going back and gravitating towards this. I love this quote from a friend of mine. You can only ever be loved to the extent that you're known. So many of us wear masks. And when we get home, we take off the masks. Some of you, they take off the eyelashes. <laughs> They got the weave. And I told Jackie, I said, I don't have many regrets, but I wish when we officially moved to Texas, because we got here as fast as possible. She, her roots are from here. I said, I wish I would have established myself with a cool accent. And I've watched all kinds of tutorials on YouTube with those dudes that glue the hair on. Can you imagine? I'm just like Keith Urban up here. But you take off a mask and you say to yourselves, yeah, I have to keep wearing the mask because people love the mask. They don't love me. They love the version I showed them, but they don't love me. If they knew who I was, what I've done, the choices I've made, they would leave. So I just keep wearing the mask. So oftentimes we walk around lonely, feeling unloved. We consider hiding and continuing to hide our sin nature or a trait that we consider unlovable, not allowing ourselves to be known fully, and we continue to compartmentalize our experiences. This is why we believe in accountability so much here at Hope City, because when you open that door to transparency, you will be met with the truth, but you'll also be met with growth. The Bible says in Proverbs 27, 17, iron sharpens iron, so one friend sharpens a friend. Can't stress this enough. If you're not in a group, wave at me if you're in a group. I wanna encourage you, this semester is coming to a close, but we continue with summer groups. So if you stick around, we have a group for you. And I wanna encourage you, when the next semester starts, if you've never gone through freedom, if you've gone through freedom, make some noise. Come on, show them. Freedom is a game changer. It begins to peel back the layers. Here's what ends up happening. The more transparent, authentic you are, the more growth you find yourself in. Because we're always dealing with real versus counterfeit. Always. Always. Real versus counterfeit. There's always an option to go the fake route. There's always an option to say, yeah, I'm going to put the filter on with freckles. I'm going to put it on because I want everybody to think that I have freckles when I do this Instagram. And they're like, that's crazy. Where's your freckles? You're like, oh, I forgot to draw them on. And if you do draw freckles on, own them. You know what I'm saying? Just own it. That's awesome. But real versus fake, I was on a flight, true story, I was on a flight, and uh, they were passing out flights, and they are uh, passing out snacks, and they gave us these little, little, you know, little tiny containers of Pringles, just enough. And so I'm, you know, open it up, and the lady next to me is like, oh, and I'm like, oh, what's going on? She's like, I don't even like the smell of those. And I said, why? She's like, because they're not real potato chips. And I said, oh, okay. And she's like, they're potato crisps. It's kind of like Kentucky Fried Chicken. It's Kentucky Fried We Don't Know What. I would never eat those. I only eat the real things. And I said, what's in this? And she's like, well, there's like soy and corn and wheat and maybe potato. That's why they're potato crisps. They're not the real thing. Those aren't potato chips. And I said, well, I kind of deduced that because they're oddly shaped, stacked like Legos in a little tube, and they look like little saddles. Like... <laughs> I kind of assumed that they were not potato chips. She's like, mm, well, I wouldn't eat those. And as she put a strawberry starburst in her mouth, I said, that's not a real strawberry. So, ooh, drop, mic drop. We constantly deal with real and fake. I had a friend tell me, man, I got these amazing shoes overseas. They're knockoffs. You can't tell the difference. I said, really? I said, get them wet. They'll discolor and melt like cotton candy. So he shows up like, these aren't even fake. Or, and I was like, yeah, they are. And he's like, no, they're not. 
And he realized very quickly when he put them next to the real thing, you could tell. Plus, they said Mikey instead of Nike. So, I'm, <laughs> so listen, I know times are tough. If you rock the knockoffs, own it. Rock the Mikeys. Look at the person next to you and say, rock the Mikeys. Come on, rock them. <laughs> rock the Mikeys. So the woman at the well, she's dealing with all this counterfeit, self-medicated healing. She encounters the real thing. The woman at the well, her lifestyle felt real. Her love felt legitimate until Jesus' love showed up. And it was the real thing. She encountered the real thing, the agape, unconditional, unwavering, unfailing love. And that moment changed everything. Because y'all, when Jesus enters the room, we have a choice. We are faced with a choice. So number two, we have a choice to respond. We have a choice to respond. He is the God who pursues, but we have a choice to respond. Don't pass on it. Don't miss the moment. One day, you're gonna look back and be very grateful that you decided to go God's way instead of yours. How many of y'all are grateful that you've gone God's way? You said, I decided to take God's way. But let's be honest, how many of y'all have decided sometimes to go your own path? How did that turn out? You end up going back because you're like, oh, your way is so much better. Joshua 24, verse 15, it says, choose this day whom you will serve. We're all gonna serve something. The pursuit of money, climbing the corporate ladder, accolades, pats on the back. We're all gonna serve something or someone. The Bible in Joshua says, choose this day whom you will serve. Is he your priority? The lady didn't know that she could experience life changing living water until she encountered the real thing. When you encounter Jesus, we're always faced with a, either you go his way or you go your own way. But when we choose him, we discover, and we've all discovered his way is so much better. And when you've chosen him, then we have this obligation because he's a God that pursues. We have a choice to respond. We have this obligation and responsibility, number three, to pass it on. I tell everybody about Jesus. I share this often, but I talk to people about Jesus all the time. Why? Because of the night and day difference he's made in me. Yes, there's still broken moments and things I'm in process of being healed from, but I can't help but get in the way of somebody's storm and say, hey, he sees you, he loves you. He's not mad at you, he's madly in love with you. This verse has been my anthem. If you've been around Hope City for any amount of time, you know how much I love 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. You're the ones chosen by God. Come on, say it out loud, I'm chosen. It says, chosen for the high calling of priestly work. Now, Paul's, it doesn't mean you have to have a microphone. It doesn't mean you ever have to preach, but your life speaks more. Who you are, who Christ is in and through you, people will read your life statistically more than they'll read the Bible. There's something different about her. When he walks in the room, I just feel fear dissipate. We're all called, chosen to be a holy people. God's instruments to do his work, to speak out for him. That's the pass it on. To tell others the night and day difference he's made in you. From nothing to something, from rejected to accepted. The Bible says in Ephesians 5, 8, and this was what happened to the woman at the well who found herself compartmentalizing her pain, dealing with all kinds of broken moments and things hidden in the darkness. Ephesians 5, 8 says, for once you were full of darkness, but now you have the light from the Lord. So live as people of the light. Live as people of the light. I remember I had a moment in high school that defined me. It marked my entire life. I had an encounter with Jesus my senior year where I made a choice in that moment to realign my heart to the heart of God. It was not just my parents saying, you need to be in church, you better read your Bible, you should probably pray. It actually became real to me. And y'all, I, I, I was on fire. Like it was an Acts 2 breath of God moment where I felt filled up with the Spirit of God and what fills spills. So I'm walking down the hallway of our school. There was kids everywhere, folks everywhere, and we had a huge game. 
We had just played. We're about to go into the semifinals, basketball. And the night before, your boy hit five threes. Come on, somebody. And so we're excited. We're about to go into this game. And I'm telling everybody, you going to the game? You going to the game? What's up? You going to the game? You going to the game? And I put my hand on this guy's shoulder, and he spins around like I was going to hit him. He's like, and I said, whoa. Take it easy. I said, what? You good, bro? He's like, yeah, what's up? I said, you going to the game tonight? And he said, no. So what are you talking about? We're in the semifinals. This is a big game. I'm going to put 40 up. Actually, it's called 43. It was a career high. It's a true story. True story. Had seven threes, Edwin. You know I got the flick of the wrist. You know it. <laughs> Sit back there with your diamond earrings. You better watch. Watch it, Edwin. So I invite him to the game. He said, I've never been to a game. I said, are you new here? He said, I, I, I've been in school with you since you were 13. I said, what's up, my guy? Look at his seat. I didn't recognize him because I had been so consumed by me, myself, and I, I hadn't let my light shine. I ended up inviting this guy to the game. Y'all, he ends up one of the funniest guys I'd ever met. He ends up hanging with us the rest of our senior year. I mean, hilarious, quick-witted at another level. We're all like, where's this dude been? Everybody's like, I think he just transferred here. I was like, no, guys, we've known him forever. <laughs> so years go by. Jackie and I are married. We're walking through this mall called Woodlands, Woodland Hills Mall in Tulsa. This dude walks up with kind of a beard. I say kind of a beard because well, he had a lot of hair, but he kind of had a beard. I, this is a beard, but he had a lot of hair. And so he's like, Daniel Grove. So I was like, hey, you. You know what? Like, you don't know. I was like, you. What's up, guy? Like, and this is what he said to me. Watch this. Man, I want to tell you, you saved my life. I don't recognize him. It's changed lives. Pretty Jack looks like he got involved in CrossFit. And Jackie's like, oh, that's, that's precious. It's a heavy statement. I said, it saved your life. Wow, man, that's, that's a loaded statement. I'm, I'm, I'm literally going, I'm going back to like 15, 16. I'm in, doing lifeguard training. I was like, I do CPR on this guy? That I, I didn't do mouth to mouth. Like, what's happening? What is, and I said, I, say, I, say, I saved your life. He tells me the story I just told you from his perspective. He said, I'm standing at my locker. And I said, you're a ghost. No one knows you're here. And no one will care when you're gone. And as I'm saying it, I felt you touch my shoulder and I turned around and I thought you were going to hit me. And you said, bro, why'd you flinch? And you invited me to a game and what you didn't know was that morning I wrote a goodbye letter to my mom. My dad ran out. My whole life was falling apart. I was going to take my life because my mom was going to work late. I was going home to end it all in isolation. You got in the way of my storm. You got in the way and you showed me that I had a purpose that just by inviting me to the game made me feel seen. I just want you to know, I went home and tore the letter up. I hugged my mom. I said, I'm going to become somebody. He said, I'm the first guy in my family to graduate college. I'm on fire for God. I'm involved in my church. All because you put your hand on my shoulder and told me I mattered that I was seen. I had just said no one sees me. Because God pursued me, I decided to start pursuing others. We can pursue people. We can present a choice to people because y'all, again, healthy people help people. We get in the way of people's storms. So this final week of the difference a day makes, all it takes is one moment. It took one encounter with Jesus to change everything in my life, to get my attention and focus off of me. And thank God. Put my hand on his shoulder. And I invited him to a game. How many people do we walk by every single day? You were once in darkness, but now you have the light of God in you. So choose to walk as children of the light. All it takes is one 
encounter in your lowest place, one encounter at a coffee shop with a stranger to change the, the trajectory of Jackie and I's future, one encounter in a church service to walk out healed. All it takes is one, one encounter with a woman in the cereal aisle for my mom to see that she's not far from hope. One encounter, just one. With every eye closed just for a moment because it just takes one response. If the Holy Spirit is maybe nudging your heart right now, all it takes is one decision for everything to change. We don't pray prayers for symbolic reasons. We pray because according to Romans 10, verse 9 and 10, confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart and he will change everything. In just a moment, we're gonna go back into a time of worship for just a few moments. So I'm just gonna ask that nobody leaves. I believe that today, the light of God is gonna become more bright in our lives and there's some things that we can let go of because just like the woman at the well, she witnessed the faithfulness of a savior. You're here today, and I'm gonna to count to three. I'm not gonna be long. If you're at Woodlands, Katie, watching online, if you're watching online, just say yes. Our team will help you. If you're in the room at West Houston, if you're across one of our other locations, watch parties in Tanzania, and you would say, Daniel, I don't know Jesus as my Savior, but I want to. One, I want to give my life to Jesus for the very first time. When I hit three, I want you to boldly say you're talking about me. Two, I want to rededicate my life. The truth is I've witnessed his faithfulness but I found myself putting myself in a position like the woman at the well in the hottest part of the day going by myself as I find compartmentalizing my pain keeps shame pushed away. Today, I wanna just let go of it. I no longer wanna compartmentalize this pain. I wanna put it in the hands of a father who can heal me. Two, I wanna rededicate my life. Three, if you're either one of those two invitations, would you lift up your hand? I see you. One, two, I see you. Three, I see you. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. I see you. I see you. I see you. Come on, come on, Hope City. Can we give God praise for our 13 friends that said, you're talking about me today. You can put your hands down. I want everybody to say this out loud. Say, Jesus, it's me. I've been living for me, but from today on, I'm making a choice to live for you. I'm no longer going to compartmentalize my pain, but I'm going to freely surrender it in all my shame. Thank you for hanging on the cross for my life. Even though I didn't deserve it, you did it because I was worth it. From this moment on, I choose you. Thank you for choosing me. You're my father. You're my Savior. You're my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, Hope City, can we give God praise? Let's go.